Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorraine Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is Tom Johnson. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Lorraine. Well, you've taught me so much about this new kind of global movement called open data. And before we get into your telling everyone else what it is, talk a little about your background, because I know that you're the regional director for the Society of Professional Journalists, but you have over 40 years of journalism experience teaching and as an active journalist. Tell us a little about your background. Well, I did an undergraduate degree in journalism, but just barely. It was equal number of credits in social sciences. And so when I did my graduate work, I did it in American studies and got into this area at that time called exploratory data analysis. And mm -hmm. it happened that I was looking at the techni technological implications of change in the late 19th century. But then I was lucky enough to get a job in San Francisco with Scientific American in the mid-70s. And I uh, was working with Scientific American, but also I continued working for Time Magazine. And even at that time, we were in the very early stages of Silicon Valley. And so nobody else in the Bureau was interested in covering that, and I was freelancing and wanted to get whatever uh, uh, stories I could pick up. And so I ended up covering, from the late 70s on, really the early, early days of the digital revolution as we saw it in Silicon Valley. At the same time, uh, by the late 80s, uh, I was using those tools that we have in computing, things like spreadsheets, to analyze data and dig down into that data to see where the stories are, where they should go. Uh, the data itself is never the story, but it does point to patterns that we can start to see as reporters. So I've been both working as a journalist and also teaching data journalism, what's called data journalism now since uh, the late uh, 1990 thereabouts, uh, both here and I do a lot of teaching um, mostly in Latin America, but also in Europe and in uh, Australia. Well, you are a professor of journalism emeritus from San Francisco sure. State University. You've also taught at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism, but what, what I'm, I'm thrilled about is that you had the catbird seat for the early Silicon Valley burgeoning, because you not only wrote for time, but you wrote for popular science. Yes, that's right. Because yeah. we didn't realize the social implications. Well, I don't know that many of us did, but it was a fascinating time. I, because of my background in the history of technology, I, I had a particular um, perspective, I think, on what was happening. I didn't know how fast it was going to be happening, and I didn't know the degree to which it was happening. Um, but it was just, as I say, the uh, very lucky to be in the right place at the right time for those kinds of stories. So I... You first introduced me to the term open data, and can you tell our audience what you mean by that? I'll, tr I'll try to do it briefly. Okay. Since the beginning of writing, we're talking 5,000 years in Egypt, uh, the government has collected records and maintained them, collected data and maintained those records. And as we get closer and closer through time, we see taxpayers are paying government to collect that data. Now, data is fundamental to everything we do as humans. We take in data in a variety of forms. Sometimes it's words, sometimes we hear things, we see things, it could be pictures, it could be maps, whatever. We take in that data and analyze it, and as a result of that analysis, certain actions come out on the other end. Now, in the United States, since even before we, we had our own independence, government was collecting data that taxpayers were paying for. It was difficult to get at that data because it was ink on paper and it was stored away in records and hard to find. But now, in the last 20 plus years, certainly, essentially all data that government collects and maintains is in digital format. Taxpayers are still paying for it. And so when we talk about open data, we're making two points. One is that it is the people's data, and we should be able to see that data and do so very easily. Secondly, 
government has traditionally been responsible for conducting elections, uh, for maintaining public security, for building infrastructure and so forth. Um, today, I submit that government is also responsible for making the people's data available to the people essentially as a default. So if the government has records about finance, um, about traffic patterns, about education, about health care, what government agencies at all levels should be doing is putting that data out there in a fine-grained form, the original file type, and make it available as easy as possible for citizens, broadly defined. The a surprising thing to me is that when I first got into this, I came at it as a citizen and as a journalist. What I quickly discovered was that the first beneficiaries of this philosophy are people who work for government because suddenly they can get at the data they need to do their job in an efficient, valuable way. Valuable way. For example, suppose you're on the Planning Commission. You need to be able to see the data about traffic flows. You need to quickly see the data about zoning. You quickly need to see the data about building permits, that kind of thing, in order to be a good planner. So if you can do that at the computer keyboard, instead of searching all over town to try to find the answers mm -hmm. to those questions, then A, your job is going to be more fun because you're going to be doing meaningful work. Second beneficiaries of this concept is that great deal of money can be saved both in efficiency of government employees but also in reducing the demands that citizens make on government. There are a few examples for example, uh, that, we, that we know of now. I um, just made some quick notes here. For example, um, in the first nine months that Chicago's Department of Public Health took this open data concept, they reduced the number of Freedom of Information Act requests by 65 oh. percent. So right away, there's multiple hours being saved. It's time and money being exactly saved. Exactly so. Um, the city of San Francisco um, has a system called 311 where people would call to find out when their buses are coming. Right. The first uh, six months on that, they had 21% fewer calls in that. They decreased the call volume, which saved them more than a million dollars a year. Mm. So if people in government say, well, no, this is too costly to do, I submit that, in fact, it's one of the things that we need to do in order to save money. So today, then, the responsibility of government is the infrastructure, the elections, et cetera, that I said, but also to put the people's data out there for all of the people. Another advantage that I, I learned from reading your work is that the economic development people, people who are working on economic growth, it's fabulous for them to have access to this information. Precisely so. And the great thing about the digital revolution or the digital age is that if you're going to start a business that is a retail business, you're going to want to get demographic data about your community. Who lives where? What are their spending habits, etc.? And that all exists out there. You can start with the Bureau of the Census, which is very, very good at giving the people's data out there. You can scale that down to your local town. You couple that with traffic patterns. You couple that with real estate, uh, commercial real estate availability, etc. And pretty soon you have the, corner, the foundation for a very good business plan. The other people that benefit our journalists. We do. Um, and I, but I, th I think, I really think that we are about third or fourth down on the list. Remember that journalists are just citizens who happen to have a specific job. Mm -hmm. And it's more important, I believe, that uh, interested people in the community be able to get this data about the community. Um, the financial data is especially important to see where money from bond issues, for example, mm -hmm has gone or is supposed to, is it gone where it's supposed to go? Let me put it that way. So it's, it's for the community at large, and yes, journalists do uh, take advantage of that or will use that access, but it's really a much bigger community that benefits, I believe. Now we've listed the advantages and who benefits. What do people say, what do the detractors say are the disadvantages? Well, one of the big disadvantages, uh, as you might think, is, is issues of privacy and public security. Um, so my conclusion is, and, and this is a back-of-the-envelope study, is that about 85% of the 
people's data, which governments have and maintain, have no issues of security at all. 15% of the things might involve health, they might involve uh, public safety, certain issues. And so we need leadership, both in the community and at the government level, to start the conversation about how do we vet this data and control it in a variety of ways. This gets to a much larger issue of privacy, which is been, being addressed in different manners all over the world. Germany and Canada, I know for, uh, for a fact, have privacy commissioners, and their really? job is to regulate what data gets out. In the case of Germany, the presumption is that all of the data about you is yours, and nobody can use it unless you give explicit permission to use that data for a specific mm. uh, goal or task. Um, by and large, in the United States, this has not been discussed in a, in a meaningful, serious way, uh, certainly by the politicians. Everybody says, well, I'm in favor, favor of transparency. Well, yeah, okay, aren't we all? They also say, well, I'm in favor of privacy. Well, let's drill down into that a, a lot deeper and find out what that means. Well, there are a lot of buzzwords that, like transparency, sunlight, they say the best disinfectant is sunlight. So talk about this go global concept of open data in terms of these words we keep hearing more and more, sure. transparency, sunlight, and you mentioned F FOIA, Freedom of Information right. Act, and the custodians of public records or the public records providers. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, that, that's a big menu that you just laid yes. out. Um, I first heard about this concept about six or eight years ago. I was teaching a workshop in Manchester, England for European journalists, and this guy from Bulgaria raised his hand and said, have you heard about open data? I said, no, tell me about it. So that got me on the trail, and within a few months I was seeing messages on listservs from the Philippines saying, what's going on in the Philippines with open data? The one that surprised me the most came from southern Sudan. Now, keep in mind, this is six or eight years ago. <laughs> People in southern Sudan are asking about open data. It is isn't now a global concept. I was at a meeting in Mexico City last October and, and made a small presentation there, but there were 2,000 people from all over the world uh, talking about this. Many governments, including our own in the United States, have signed on. The White House is uh, doing a lot of good and impressive work, investing money and time in this whole concept of open data and transparency. Um, there, what, what we hope to find is that the, the culture of people who work in government will be able to make a switch so that they understand that their job is not to be data huggers, which is a, a concept. Mm -hmm. They can protect the data, but their job is to make the data available, both to their colleagues and other departments, but to the citizens. And, and that um, takes a good bit of, of uh, effort. We're speaking today with Tom Johnson, who is the director of the Institute for Analytic Journalism. Right. We're talking about open data. Well, among my readings, you had talked about an image that really made sense to me. Uh, it's a little hard, it's just a, a metaphor really. Say that I had just bought a, the most expensive, huge, beautiful, large screen TV, and yet the government wants to handle my access to that. Well, Can you talk about in, that In this image? metaphor I, I laid out, not uh, you bought the TV, you paid for it, mm -hmm. but the store that sold you the TV is keeping it in the back room. Mm -hmm. And you can look at it, maybe, when the store decides that it's okay to look at it, uh, on its schedule, not your schedule, and maybe you can look at the TV, but maybe you can only hear the sound from it, you can't get the full result of the, of the pictures. That is sort of what's happening in government. For example, there's a now, unfortunately, a long tradition of people in government agencies keeping the data as PDF files. And I don't want to get too much in the weeds on this, but yeah. a PDF file is great for pictures and graphics. But if you forms. It informs, yeah, yeah. that's right. But if you want to analyze the city's budget, if you have it as a PDF file, you have to essentially pay in time or in actual money to get that 150 pages of the city of Santa Fe budget, run it through a conversion system in order to extract those numbers to get it into a spreadsheet so you can start to add some things up.
or divide things up and make classifications. So um, we hope that eventually people who work for government will put the data out there in the original file format right, that's easy to download. And second thing, uh, the goal that I have for this, the El Dorado vision for this yeah. project, is that if we can change the title of people in government agencies from public records custodian to public records provider, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. their job, provide those public records. You well, can do that while maintaining the veracity of all of those records, but that's what we need to be doing. Well, we found that in many administrations where they have public information officers whose job is, in effect, to keep information from the public. Right. And a journalist or a concerned citizen has to go through the Freedom of Information Act and just pester them and pester them to get information that should be freely available. And, you know, you wonder what they're afraid of. There also is, for example, in this administration, over a million dollars being paid to these public information officers who are being paid to withhold information rather than provide it. That's right. And, and how much skill does it take to say, no, you can't have it? Yeah. <laughs> right? Um, and uh, we have two divergent curves going on. One is that there's a decreasing number of journalists covering state capitals, for example. And this is happening all over the country. Um, some years ago, not too long ago, there was a ratio of one journalist to about two and a half public information officers in government. Or PR people, in effect, they are. Yes, yeah. yes they are. Yeah. Today, that ratio is one to five, mm. um, partially because of the declining number of journalists, but also because this increase in hiring, uh, we could say, used to say gatekeepers, but I think they're gate lockers in, in yeah. many cases. Yeah. Um, so I was astonished to learn, I mean, I followed the Sunshine Portal that the states hits up, and that Albuquerque is unique in the world. Talk to me about what Albuquerque is doing it, with it open is. data. It, it, it's an interesting story in that when Mayor Barry was elected a few years ago, he called in his IT people and he said, why when we were running the campaign, couldn't we find out any information about the city of Albuquerque? We need to change that. And so a friend of mine, uh, the guy who's become a friend of mine, Mark Leach, was assigned to this job of putting the data sets of the city of Albuquerque up online. But the unique thing, this is, many cities do this, but the thing that's unique for Albuquerque is that they make a, it makes available what we call the metadata. That is the definitions of each of the variables, let's say in a spreadsheet. Um, and each department is responsible for making that metadata available. So this might include, um, let's say if you have a, a data set of street addresses, there are various programs for assigning street addresses. Some of them are based on the median line in the street, but others are based on an actual street address in front of a house. Right? So you have to define what is a street address. How do we create a street address and put this in? Albuquerque is, I say, is the only city I've found in the world which puts up this metadata along with the data sets. The reason why that's important is that programmers can write a scripts, programs that are called APIs, Applied Programming Instructions, which will go out and look at a website and pick out just individual variables in a very large data set. And knowing what the definition of those variables is is key. Uh, primarily, you need to know it if these things are changing. For example, in crime reports, if we talk about the arrests for for marijuana, if we look at what constitutes a marijuana possession felony today, it's significantly less in many cases than it was 20 years ago. So you have to be able mm -hmm. to understand those definitions to interpret the data over time. So uh, there's talk about some national cities that are doing very well with this, and the White House, too. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm talking about national cities first. Curiously enough, Boston and New York, IT people, got together on uh, being directed by the mayor of both of those cities. And the mayor said, we've got to have a good policy for making this data open. You guys work it out, but do it in a format that can be explained 
easily and cleanly to our citizens. And so forget about the Red Sox and the Yankees rivalry. Mm -hmm. These yeah. guys got together and they have put together very good documents saying this is the policy and the vision both cities use for open data. It's, it's, there are curiosities come out of that. For example, the most popular data set for the city of New York is a census of trees. Ah. <laughs> the city of New York has the equivalent of a birth certificate for every tree, when it was planted, what the species uh. is, how often does it get watered, etc. And people apparently rely on this to make sure their trees are maintained. It's important to do that because they need to be trimmed periodically, mm -hmm. etc. So that kind of work is going on. San Francisco going back into the mid-aughts, uh, 2005 I was working with that data, again, takes a, has taken a very much of an innovative approach, and it is especially strong in having what we call a GIS, Geographical Information Systems Oriented Data. So much of the data, wherever possible, that can be mapped is, and so a lot of people will uh, intuitively uh, use maps to understand their city. Now, is this part of what's called the Smart Cities Initiative? It's related to it. It's very much related to it. Smart cities is even broader than the data sets we already have. For example, the city of Chicago, um, now we're going back about a year and a half, mounted, my understanding is, 1,400 essentially empty boxes, like about the size of a switch box, all over the city. Those boxes are there, there's electricity into the boxes, there's fiber optics into the boxes, and they're there for anybody who has a project where they want to put sensors in those boxes. So the sensors might have to do with air quality, the sensors might have to do with unusually loud sounds, uh, traffic patterns, etc., so that they're studying the really the dynamic, constant dynamic of how cities work. That's part of the smart cities kind of in initiatives. Mm -hmm. Now the White House. The White House has been, as I said, very strong in setting up and, and staffing people who are out working with communities all over the country through a variety of programs. There's a, I don't know if you've run across Code for America. Do you, do yeah. you know this program? This is a program where young people, it's sort of like VISTA or like the teacher's um, teaching core, whatever that is, where people who are skilled programmers are taking a year or two uh, to work in cities, developing applications that the city can use. Albuquerque has had uh, some for the past couple of years, I know. The White House is pushing that very hard. The White House is also pushing police departments very hard to put their data out there. And here again, Nobody is saying they should put out investigations in progress, but people are saying, um, gee, I heard the sirens last night, last night in my neighborhood, what's up with that? And so by putting that data out there to say, yeah, we are answering a call for a, um, an elderly person with Alzheimer's who wandered away, uh, mm -hmm. let's get a look at that so I can have a good sense of what's happening in my neighborhood. So what other cities in San, in, is Santa Fe one of the cities that's working toward open data? And who else in the state can we look at as a good example? Of? Uh, well, we mentioned Albuquerque. Yeah. Um, Santa Fe has, is fortunate to have a very good IT director, uh, I believe, and a very good finance director. And they are in the process of moving as much data up into the online world as they possibly can. Um, we, this past spring, had a group of students who came from a, a college in the East called Worcester Polytech Institute, and they used open data that we have in Santa Fe, and we've created a prototype dashboard. And if somebody goes to Santa Fe Open Data dot, it's the People's Data dot org, um, they will be able to see this dashboard, which has um, election. Uh, in, in data sets on it, uh, school data sets, and some public health data sets on it. And so this was the first step for the city of Santa Fe. Um, other cities, Gallup, surprisingly, has an IT director who, again, is working with Mark Leach in Albuquerque, and they are very quickly putting their data up there. Why are people so 
attracted and interested in this. You know, I mean, it's, it goes beyond knowledge is power. People have a deep sense of justice and they feel that, you know, you tell me why, why this is becoming more and more, you know, more people are interested. And then I want you to tell some sources that people can go to so that they can help work on this too, open sure. data. Um, I think people are curious, fundamentally. We want to know what's going on in our town, in our neighborhood, in our county, state, etc. And and this kind of data is one way to do that. Um, because remember, we're not just talking about statistical information here. We're talking about being able to get in to see the the archives of photography in the in the museums that we have here in Santa Fe, and that tells us something about our town then, and we can compare it to our town now. I think people are also at at least curious if if uh, about what's happening to our taxpayer money. Um, there are a lot of people who are suspicious of what government does. My experience as a reporter is that. Most people who work for government care about their jobs in a positive way, and they're pretty good. And and so, but we still want to know where that money went. And so things come up, like in Santa Fe, this thirty million dollar bond issue, which sort of <laughs> disappeared. <laughs> and or the record keeping. Let me, let me put it this way: the record keeping was quite unusual. Um, so I think that's a motivational factor. Now we know that people will, yeah, they'll look up their neighborhood's tax record, uh, neighbors' tax records and appraisal yeah. records and so forth. Well, that's just your standard voyeurism in the neighborhood. Yeah. So if people want to know more, can you recommend? Well, first of all, your site. Yeah, it's on on Facebook, and if you just look for it's the people's data on Facebook would be our best site. Uh -huh. um, but the the people who are really leading this movement in many ways is the Sunlight Foundation, sunlightfoundation dot org. I think it's dot com. Dot com. I did yes, just, thank yeah. you. You're right. Dot uh -huh. com. Also, there's a commercial company called Socrata, dot com which is make software for cities to put this data up. And it has a lot of good case studies where people can see what's going on, uh, in, especially in the United States. Well, thank you so much. Our guest today has been Tom Johnson, but you have revealed so much. You've made open data much more open for me. I think this is something people really need to know about. I'm very grateful to you well, for coming you. and telling us. Thank you. Remember, it's the people's data. Yes, exactly. <laughs> And I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for joining us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.